Welcome to Defining Moments. I am Suzanne Quast, and I want to start this episode off with a question. And that is, what kind of life would we live if we didn't let fear hold us back? Would we have our dream job? Would we fall madly in love? Or would we even just start to begin to speak up for ourselves? Many of us, including myself, believe that we could live more boldly, achieve more success, and live fuller if we could just stop or get rid of that inner critic, that inner voice inside our heads. But how? Well, our guest today is going to tell us how. She is a life coach, a speaker, and author of The Courage Habit, Kate Swabata, aka Kate Courageous. Today, she's going to talk to us about fear, how we can release old fear patterns, and also create courageous habits that can allow us to live more boldly in all aspects of our lives. Here are her moments. This is super exciting. Yeah. So to everybody, this is the first time I'm ever, or that Kate and I are meeting. And a girlfriend of mine bought me Kate's book for my birthday and I read it and I have underlined tons of things. I did all of the exercises, but I have to say when I first read your intro in the book, I was like, oh, I have to have this woman on my show. And you talked about a defining moment in your life. And I think you even said something to the effect that you hadn't had a lot of earth shattering moments, but this was one of them. Can you share with everybody what that was? Well, I was sitting in a meeting at a job that I had, you know, gone to school and gotten all the good grades for and, you know, made my way through all the different hierarchies of career ladders for and joined the right committees for. And um, I wasn't happy. And I would have defined myself at that point as being a very pragmatic person. So that's why I say in the book, like, I wasn't someone prone to like the, oh, and everything's different. And I'm always looking for signs from the universe. It was very like logical lockstep. And I was sitting in this meeting and it could have been in part that it was the last meeting of the end of the day, right before Christmas vacation. That was my tipping point. But, you know, people were talking at that meeting about doing a project over Christmas vacation. And suddenly something this you know, the voiceless voice, intuition, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, came up and said, I don't want to do this anymore. And it it shocked me because it was like, well, since when I've done everything that I was supposed to do to get right here? Yep. It looks good on paper. What do you mean? It, you know, and it was one of those moments where like colleagues are sitting around and I, I'm having this thought and almost feeling like, can anyone else tell that I'm like sitting here realizing I don't want to do this anymore? It was too much. But I think that's so relatable. I mean, there's probably people out there, at least for me too, Mm -hmm. I was in a sales job and I had this same kind of moment. I was like, I don't want to do this. This is like sucking my soul. I am not happy. And so, you know, I'm sure there's people with jobs or in relationships or just something in their life isn't working. And one of the things that you say is in order to make bold, courageous change, you have to understand the habitual ways that are helping us and also stopping us. Can you explain a little bit more about habits and why they're important and what they and what they are? Yeah, well, a big thing that I came to realize during that period was that the fear was okay, that we don't get rid of fear. We don't fight fear. We're not trying to silence the fear. We're trying to figure out how to work with the fear as it comes. And as I began to get into this more and more and more through my own journey, later through becoming a coach, working with clients, doing speaking gigs, facilitating, what I found was that fear-based behaviors are actually habitual. I mean, there's a reason why you can have the same New Year's resolution so many years in a row, or there's a reason why in a relationship you can be like, you know, it's years later and I feel like I'm having that same argument with my partner. It's because brushing your teeth and going to the gym, those are the habits we think of, but actually our behavioral responses can become habitual too. And we can have fear-based behavioral responses. And my hope is in, you know, people reading the book and getting into this work that they'll interrupt those responses and go, I can change this habit. And the research indicates that they're actually courageous habits um, that are going to boost your emotional resilience and have you, instead of defaulting to that fear, going into your life like, Mm -hmm. oh, I've got this. Speaking of research, I appreciated, you know, I'm into the woo woo stuff with self-help, but I also really like practical scientific things that can actually help bring about change. So, you know, one of the things you mentioned was this thing of cue, routine, reward. Can you explain that? 
Yes. So the the way that habits work in the brain, I like to think of um, the brain as almost kind of a personification, makes it simpler to understand. Okay. So if you were talking to a neuroscientist, they would say, Kate, you're being too reductive, but I'm trying to keep it simple. So habits are formed in a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia I think of as being like a project manager for the brain. You go through your life, stimuli is coming at you. Mm -hmm. You know, people say things cars cut you off in traffic, your boss says something that's kind of stressful, and you respond. And the basal ganglia really likes being able to go, ah, we've encountered this before, here's how we need to respond. Mm. So there's a cue, which is that stimuli. There's a routine, which is the response to that cue or that trigger. And that routine is designed to get you to the reward. And the reward is something of a misnomer because really it's not always a reward that feels good, it's whatever happens to work in the moment to decrease stress. So, you know, sometimes people be like, well, what about that argument example? How is it a reward for me to have the same argument over and over with my partner? So what I'll say is, well, when that cue of stress from the argument comes up, if you go into a routine of getting a pot shot in, it's probably because you want a reward in that moment, like feeling more in control or Uh. feeling like I'm not going to be the sucker in this argument. And that's a short-term reward. It's a comfort zone. It's a place you know. You feel a little bit more in control. But of course, it's not a long-term reward because every time you get that pot shot in, it just creates more scar tissue in the relationship. Which is so interesting because I also felt, and one of the things you said in your book that really resonated with me is actually this thing inside our heads is trying to protect us. Yeah. So it's trying to provide us with immediate relief. And like you said, that's maybe not in alignment with our long-term goals. Yes. But then how do we stop that? How do we stop that in when it's happening? Yeah. So that voice in your head, I call it the critic. I encourage people to use a really neutral term because terms like monster or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. gremlin, like that, that's, you know. If the goal is unconditional love for ourselves, we can't say, you know what? I'm going to unconditionally love myself, except for this part over here that's the critic. I want that part to shut up, F off, go away. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. So we have to understand it better. The critic is just a wound. It's a part of us that has been wounded before that's trying to avoid further wounding. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's going to go into some kind of behavior that will bring that short-term comfort. And the more that we can recognize what it is that the critic needs and start interrupting the fear-based routines that have become habitual and instead practicing some of the courageous behaviors that can become a courage habit, that's how we actually get ourselves past, as you put it, you know, that point where the fear is limiting us. What we want is we don't want to try to get rid of the fear. We want to stop putting it in the driver's seat, making it the thing that dictates our choices. Yep. Okay, so then you also said in your book that the fear routine, in order to change our lives, we have to change the fear routine. The routine in the middle between cue, routine, reward, yeah. And then you said that there's also four fear routines that are prevalent in people. Can you explain what those are? Totally, yeah. So there are four predominant fear routines, fear patterns that I see. We all do all of them, but usually one hooks us more than the rest. And whenever I talk about these, I encourage people to really push to see where they do all of them rather than going, oh, I don't do that one. Because actually, when you push it away, that's the one you probably do the most. (laughs) Um, And they are perfectionism, people-pleasing or martyrdom, pessimism, and self-sabotage. So I like to start with perfectionism because most people can identify with it and also because it's my biggest hook. I'm like raising my hand on that one. (laughs) Um, Perfectionism, it's, you know, it's never enough, always striving for more, being really concerned with image, always trying to do better, feeling super disappointed with results, even if they're great results, um, hypercriticism of the self and others. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Pretty familiar territory for us. So if I put that into, right? <laughs> yes. I get it. <laughs> if I put that into Q routine reward, it's like, let's say that you really have some big dream of, I don't know, writing a book, traveling the world. If you go into perfectionism to try to have some control around it as your routine, in the short term, you're going to feel more in control. You'll get that reward. But of course, where does perfectionism always lead? It leads to burnout. It leads to, you know, feeling like you're on a self-help hamster wheel. Yep. And then there is people-pleasing, or in the book I call it martyrdom, but people-pleasing is a term people can identify with. That's, you know, putting everybody else's priorities ahead of your own. Um, If you still work for a salary job, always being the person who stays late, who takes on the extra work. 
um, feeling like you're selfish if you tell your kids, well, you know what, you actually have to figure out how to get that ride from soccer practice. I have this priority I'd like to hold for myself. Mm -hmm. So that same, must be hard for a lot of moms, I oh, would assume. Yeah, definitely. And I am a mom and I totally get how that can come up for people. It's definitely because we get a lot of cultural conditioning yep. into perfectionism. We get a lot of cultural conditioning into people pleasing. There's cultural validation all over the place for each of these routines. So then we have what do we have next. We have pessimism. Pessimism. Yeah. So pessimism is like that wet blanket womp womp. And um, by the way, huge fear pattern that sometimes people will go into that's part of the next one we'll talk about self-sabotage is to find a pessimistic person to talk to about their dreams. Mm, but pessimism, my gosh, that's so interesting. <laughs> I feel like you've just like connected the dots for me, but okay, go on. So pessimism is like, it's not, it's, what's the point? Let's be realistic. You know, if that person is creative or that person is courageous so they could do it. I couldn't do it. Um, it's not seeing possibility even when possibility is right there. So pessimism, exactly what it sounds like. Hardest one for people to own for themselves, by the way. Mm. So why is that? I think because we have a cultural thing around don't be a whiner. Or don't, don't be wallow. negative. Don't be negative. Exactly. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. But people don't recognize that pessimism is a form of pain. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay. And then the last one. Self-sabotage. Yeah. And these are all forms of self-sabotage, but I put self-sabotage in its own category because it has some really specific behaviors, like taking two steps forward, one step back, shiny object syndrome, always putting your fingers in something new to the point where the stuff you've been trying to develop doesn't even get a chance to really go anywhere. Um, in you know the world of diet and exercise, it would be well, I worked out this morning so I can have the triple triple layer chocolate cake <laughs> that like has all the sugar on top that's going to make me feel gross and that might not be in alignment with me getting healthy. So, and you can have, because when you say all of these, I feel like maybe I'm just crazy and I've like, I identify <laughs> with all of them, maybe in different aspects of my life. So maybe for relationships, I'm one, like I'm a people pleaser, but in my professional life, I feel like I'm a combination between a perfectionist and a saboteur. Mm -hmm. So and you can be, you're saying all of them at different times. They can all show up in different times and in different contexts. And usually there's just one big pattern that hooks you. And, and like with that example you just gave, the thought that comes to me is maybe people pleasing is a form of perfectionism that shows up in your relationships. Like I'll oh. be perfect for this person by yes. pleasing them. Is there, yeah. That just rang really true. Yeah. <laughs> I am big on, um, I, and I really love being transparent about this because, like I said, pessimism is hard for people to own. I'm the, like, perfectionist who, like, goes full tilt into workaholic mode when I'm not being conscious, of course. And then when the burnout hits, slides into pessimism. Mm. Like, oh, I worked so hard for that and it didn't work out, you know, which or, is really tied to perfectionism because not working out is usually, like, it just didn't, like, knock it out of the park in as big of a way as I'd hoped. It did something good, just didn't become massive, you know? So, okay. So now we have, and we have a greater understanding of this, and then you have four steps to have a courageous life, right? So what are your four steps? Well, I think of them as like process driven because you don't have to do them in order, but here's what the research indicates. Okay. So mm -hmm. first of all, you want, if you recognize yourself in any of this, anyone who's watching this and you're like, I want to change that first, you got to start noticing what your fear patterns are. You can't just like make a list of you know, the courageous stuff you want to do and ignore the fear. You've got to deal with the fear. So when that cue of fear comes up, as soon as you notice you've gone into one of the fear routines, it's like, ah, hold on, pause. Let me do one of these four other behaviors instead. You can do one of them or all of them. Of course, more powerful if you do all of them. And they are access the body, listen without attachment, mm. reframe limiting stories, and reach out and create community. And I can of course, break those down. Yes. So start with, because access to body kind of makes sense, right? It's meditation, it's dance, it's feeling it in your body. Yes. So then the second part is listen without attachment. Yes. Can you go into a little bit more detail with that? I did the exercise in the book and it was really profound what came up. Okay. I would be so curious. I'm so curious to hear about what came up for you. Okay. So we've got accessing the body. Fear happens in the body. We got to deal with it in the body. It's not logical. It's primal. In addition to mindfulness, you can also 
Um, do a cathartic run. You can slam around some barbells, one of my favorites. <laughs> you can scream into a pillow. You can consciously cry. So you're catharting out the excess emotion and tapping into the body. Listening without attachment is listening to the fear without believing that it's telling you the truth, like really separating those two voices. Which is important. Super important, because a lot of times we think the fear is us. We think that the fear or the voice of self-criticism is who we really are inside. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that's one of our greatest fears. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the exercises you had in there that I loved was redo, please. <laughs> redo, please. Yes. So my coach, Matthew Marzell, taught me this a while ago. Um, and it's a great one to actually to do if you have like an argument with your partner. Like, okay, we got to talk. Hold on a second. I didn't like how that felt. Redo, please. But redo, please. It's a great way of listening to what it is that that internal critical voice is saying and interrupting it. So let's say it says, you know, God, you're never gonna get all this done. You get too much work. What did you think you could do? You could get all this done. It's like, uh, hold on, access the body. What am I feeling? Redo, please. You know what? Let's reframe this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna get as much done as I can get done. I might not get it all done. It doesn't mean anything about my worth. So it's not necessarily going straight to these like wildly optimistic positive affirmations so much as it is just a very pragmatic reframe. And redo please kind of gets into the, the second and third part of the process, yep. the listening without attachment and the reframing of limiting stories. And then the final one is create a community. Yes, hugely important. All the research indicates like you wanna be healthier, you wanna be happier, you wanna be anything. You got to have strong social support. And then it showed up in the psychology of courage as well, that people who are more courageous, who do those bigger, bolder things in their lives, have people they've consciously surrounded themselves with who are saying, you know, what, I think you can do this. And they don't wet blanket on their plans. Because you also said that fear lives in isolation. Yes, it thrives in isolation. I mean, you know, what's the hardest thing to do when you're having a really bad day? It's like, for me, the last time I was having the ugly cry and needed to reach out to my best friend, the hardest thing was not, you know, hitting send on the text. It was the 10 minutes beforehand, go, you know, like not wanting to be doing the ugly cry and needing to reach out to the friend. Yeah. But it's like, of course, that was exactly what I really needed. Okay, so we have two questions for our final round. And one of them is, what is the best piece of advice you were ever given? Mm -hmm. Don't take it personally. <laughs> That's such I'm a good one. to work on because it all feels personal in the moment because we're all, I mean, I think everybody, we're all such self-centered creatures on some level. Like that person cut me off in traffic and like letting it spin out my whole day. No, yep. it's not personal. And then if you could define the legacy you want to leave behind in a couple of words, what would it be? Oh, um, people believing that they can. Like the thing that breaks my heart the most is when someone doesn't think that they can. And I realize that they're believing that from a place of really encountering very real hardship or challenge or pain. Mm -hmm. And you really can transcend that. You really can shift your life. And you've given some really great exercises in order to do that. Thank you. So thank you guys. I hope you guys found this as valuable as I have. If you enjoyed this, please like, share, and comment below. And may we all live our most courageous lives.